Hello Year 12s and welcome to this, the first video in our series of two videos on key concepts in the Victorian civil justice system. It's time to take a break from the sun, sand and surf and settle in for another video on legal studies. There are three things that you need to do while you're watching this video. First, take the very best Cornell notes that you can. Second, use the pause and rewind functions. Use the pause function if you need to stop this video to take notes. Use the rewind function if you need to go over any information in this video. And the third and final thing that you need to do is have your vocabulary sheets open in front of you so that you can include in your vocabulary sheets the definitions of key terms and of any other words that you may be unfamiliar with. When you have finished watching this video, please make sure that you read the pages from the textbook referred to on this slide. And if you find any additional information from that reading that you think is useful, then supplement your Cornell notes with that additional information. Our learning intention for this video is set out on this slide. Please write this learning intention down in your Cornell notes. The learning intention is that you need to be able to describe and explain the following key concepts in the Victorian civil justice system. These are plaintiff, defendant, the burden of proof and the standard of proof. Now some of these concepts will be familiar to you from year 11. If you're comfortable with these concepts, then please skip through this video and concentrate instead on those parts of the video that provide information that you are not familiar with. The first key concept is the concept of a plaintiff. A plaintiff is a party who claims that another party has committed a civil wrong. Look down the left hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term plaintiff and write this definition in there. On this slide, I will describe the main different types of plaintiffs. The first type of plaintiff is the aggrieved party. An aggrieved party is a person whose rights have been infringed and who has suffered loss. Again, look down the left hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term aggrieved party and write this definition in there. For example, assume that Max was walking along one night when he fell into an unfenced hole in the footpath that had been dug by the Brimbank Council and breaks his leg. Max is an example of an aggrieved party. The Brimbank Council has infringed Max's right not to be negligently injured and, as a result of that infringement, Max has suffered loss. He's broken his leg and has had to pay the medical costs of having his leg treated. The second types of plaintiff exist where there is a class action. A class action is a legal proceeding in which a group of seven or more people who have a claim against the same person based on similar facts bring their claim to court in the name of one of the parties. Look down the left hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term class action and write this definition in there. Once you've done that, please highlight the words in bold red italicized type and if you're ever asked to define or describe a class action, try to remember to include those highlighted words in your definition or description. The group of plaintiffs who bring the class action are called the group members. The plaintiff in whose name the class action is brought is called the lead plaintiff. For example, a number of class actions arose out of the Black Saturday bushfires. These bushfires were caused by electricity lines swinging in a high wind and hitting each other, creating sparks which set fire to the surrounding bush. As a result of these fires, some people died and many more lost houses and other property. For each bushfire, a group of people who had suffered loss because of that bushfire brought a claim against the power company that owned the electricity lines. 
They argued that the power company had been negligent because it did not properly maintain the electricity lines, which meant that they had become loose and so could swing against each other in a strong wind causing sparks. The claim of each of these people was against the same person, that is the power company, and was based on similar facts, that is the failure by the power company to properly maintain its power lines so that in a strong wind those power lines swung against each other and sparked a bushfire. Each of these plaintiffs could have brought a separate action in negligence against the power company. However, that would mean that in each case the plaintiff would have had to establish that the power company owed them a duty of care, that the power company had breached that duty of care by not properly maintaining its electricity lines, and that the plaintiff had suffered loss. In a class action, the claim is brought by the lead plaintiff. To succeed against the power company in the negligence claim, the lead plaintiff had to establish that the power company owed the lead plaintiff a duty of care, and that the power company had breached that duty of care by not properly maintaining its electricity lines. If the court was persuaded that these two requirements had been satisfied, as was the case in the Black Saturday bushfire class actions, then it would not be necessary for the other plaintiffs, that is the group members, to prove that these two legal requirements had in fact been satisfied in their individual cases. This is because these two requirements are common to the claims of both the lead plaintiff and the group members. Of course, each of the group members will have suffered different amounts of loss. Some of the group members lost their houses, others lost their livestock, and yet others suffered physical injuries such as serious burns. Accordingly, each group member plaintiff would still have to establish the amount of the loss that they suffered because of the power company's negligence. As a matter of practice, this is something that the power company could agree with each plaintiff outside the court process. It would only be if a plaintiff and the power company could not reach agreement about the amount of loss suffered by the plaintiff that they would need to have a court determine the amount of the plaintiff's loss. You can see that the benefit of a class action is that instead of there being multiple actions against the same person based on similar facts, there is just one action brought by the lead plaintiff on behalf of the lead plaintiff and the other group members. This reduces the costs of the plaintiffs as they don't have to bring their own separate actions, and it also saves the time and resources of the courts as the court only has to deal with one case rather than with a large number of cases. The second key concept that you need to understand is the concept of a defendant. A defendant is a party who is alleged to have committed a civil wrong. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term defendant, and write this definition in there. It may be that there is more than one defendant who the plaintiff could sue for the same civil wrong. In such a case, the plaintiff will often sue all possible defendants in the same civil action so as to maximise the likelihood that the plaintiff will be fully compensated for the civil wrong that has been committed against the plaintiff. The plaintiff cannot be paid more damages, that is more compensation, than is necessary to compensate the plaintiff for the loss that the plaintiff has suffered. For example, when the plaintiff sues two defendants, this does not mean that the plaintiff receives twice the amount of damages that the plaintiff would have received if the plaintiff had only sued one defendant. However, where a plaintiff sues more than one defendant for the same civil wrong, each of those defendants will be liable to pay the damages that are awarded to the plaintiff. The plaintiff doesn't care which defendant pays the damages that are owing to the plaintiff or how the defendants share the responsibility for paying the damages. That's the defendant's problem. All the plaintiff cares about is that the damages to which the plaintiff is entitled are paid to the plaintiff. 
So, as you will see, if the plaintiff is negligently injured by a courier driver, the plaintiff will sue both the courier driver and the courier company that employs the courier driver. If the plaintiff has suffered $500,000 in losses, then between them, the courier driver and the courier company will have to pay the plaintiff $500,000. The courier driver is unlikely to have a spare $500,000, so probably the courier company will pay most, if not all, of the damages of $500,000 to the plaintiff. That is why the general rule in civil law is to sue all possible defendants, especially where one or more of the defendants has deep pockets, that is, has lots of money. That way, it is more likely that the plaintiff will be paid all of the damages that are due to them. On this slide and the next slide, I will describe the three main different types of defendants. First, there is the wrongdoer. The wrongdoer is the person who infringes the plaintiff's rights and causes the plaintiff to suffer loss. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term wrongdoer and write this definition in there. For example, suppose that Baxter is a courier driver and that he is driving well over the speed limit on a wet and overcast day because he is late in picking up a parcel. Suppose that Baxter doesn't see Molly crossing the road at a pedestrian crossing in front of him and that he hits Molly, breaking a number of her bones. In this case, Baxter is the wrongdoer because he infringed Molly's right not to be negligently injured, and as a result of the infringement, Molly has suffered loss. She has a number of broken bones and will have to pay significant medical costs for her treatment in hospital. She has suffered financial loss because her severe injuries mean that she has had to take unpaid leave from her work. And she has suffered loss of enjoyment of life because her injuries do not heal properly and so she will now always walk with a serious limp. The second type of defendant is any person who is involved in the wrongdoing. A person who is involved in the wrongdoing in the sense that they encourage or assist a wrongdoer to infringe the plaintiff's rights will have accessorial liability. That is, they will be liable to the plaintiff for encouraging or assisting the wrongdoer to infringe the plaintiff's rights. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term accessorial liability and write this definition in there. Once you've done that, highlight the words in red, bold, italicized type. And if you're ever required to define or describe the concept of accessorial liability, make sure that you include those highlighted words in your definition or description. Now, it's very important not to confuse the civil law concept of accessorial liability with the criminal law concept of accessory. An example of accessorial liability is when Dave, one of Baxter's fellow courier drivers, is travelling as a passenger in the courier van and encourages Baxter to speed so that Baxter can pick up the parcel and drop Dave off at the pickup point where Dave has arranged to meet his girlfriend to go out for drinks. In such a case, Molly can sue Baxter as the wrongdoer, that is, as the person who has infringed her rights and injured her, and can also sue Dave because Dave has accessorial liability as he encouraged Baxter to drive negligently. The third type of defendant is the wrongdoer's employer. When an employee infringes a plaintiff's rights while acting in the course of their employment, then their employer will have vicarious liability for the losses that are caused to the plaintiff. That is, the employer will be responsible to the plaintiff for the losses that are caused by the employee. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term vicarious liability and write this definition in there. Once you've done that, highlight the words in red, bold, italicized type. And if you're ever required to define or describe the concept of vicarious liability, make sure that you include the highlighted words in your definition or description.
So, in our negligent driving case, Molly could sue the courier driver Baxter, the passenger Dave, and also Baxter's employer, the courier company DHL. This is because Baxter was driving negligently while he was driving to pick up a parcel, that is, while he was acting in the course of his employment as a courier driver. Let's assume that Molly is entitled to damages of $500,000 because of Baxter's negligent driving. It's a good idea for Molly not just to sue Baxter and Dave, but also to sue DHL because it is likely that DHL will have far more money than either Baxter or Dave, and so Molly has a better chance of being paid all of the damages that are owed to her if she sues DHL as well as Baxter and Dave. Now, note that for an employer to be vicariously liable for an employee, that employee must be acting in the course of their employment. So, for example, if Baxter had injured Molly while he was driving his courier van solely on a personal errand to buy some milk from the shops, then DHL would not be vicariously liable for Molly's losses. This is because it is not part of a courier driver's employment to use their courier van to run personal errands. The third key concept in the Victorian civil justice system is the burden of proof. The burden of proof, also known as the onus of proof, is the responsibility of a party to prove a case. In a civil case, it is the plaintiff who bears the burden of proof. That is, it is the plaintiff who must prove that the defendant committed the civil wrong. Put another way, in a civil case, the defendant does not have to prove that they did not commit the civil wrong. That's because it is the plaintiff, not the defendant, who has the burden of proof in a civil case. However, you must not confuse this with the presumption of innocence in criminal cases. The presumption of innocence is a criminal concept and you must never talk about the presumption of innocence where you are dealing with a civil case. Now, even though the plaintiff has the burden of proving that the defendant committed the civil wrong against the plaintiff, there are some circumstances in which the defendant is responsible for proving other facts that are relevant to the case. That is, there are some circumstances in which the defendant has the burden of proving these other facts. The first circumstance is where the defendant brings a counterclaim, that is, where the defendant sues the plaintiff. Let's take the case of a plaintiff who agrees to sell the plaintiff's car to the defendant for $10,000, but the defendant only pays the plaintiff $6,000. In such a case, the plaintiff might sue the defendant for failing to pay the agreed price of $10,000. The plaintiff then has the burden of proving that the defendant has breached the contract between the plaintiff and the defendant by paying only $6,000 rather than $10,000 for the car. But let's now assume that the defendant thought that what the plaintiff was selling to the defendant was a new car rather than a used car, and that the plaintiff's car is actually a used car. In such a case, the defendant might counterclaim against the plaintiff. That is, the defendant might sue the plaintiff for breaching the contract between them. The defendant would be arguing that the plaintiff has breached the contract between them by selling the defendant a used car rather than a new car. To establish the counterclaim, it is the defendant who bears the burden of proving that the plaintiff has breached the contract between them by selling the defendant a used car rather than a new car. The second circumstance where the defendant has a burden of proof is where the defendant raises a defence, for example, the defence of contributory negligence. So, for instance, the defendant might have been driving a car too fast along the road when the plaintiff steps out in front of the defendant's car without looking. In such a case, the plaintiff might sue the defendant for negligence, and because the burden of proving that the defendant was negligent is on the plaintiff, it is for the plaintiff to establish that the defendant was in fact negligent. 
However, the defendant could raise the defence of contributory negligence, that is, that the plaintiff is partly responsible for their loss by crossing the road without looking. If this defence is successful, then the amount of damages that the defendant is required to pay the plaintiff will be reduced because part of the plaintiff's loss was caused by the plaintiff rather than by the defendant. However, for this defence to be successful, the defendant has the burden of proving that the plaintiff was in fact negligent so that there is contributory negligence. Now, this is very different from the criminal law, which is where the accused raises a defence, it is not for the accused to prove the existence of that defence. Instead, it is the prosecution that has the burden of proving that the defence does not exist. The fourth key concept in the Victorian civil justice system is the standard of proof. The standard of proof is the strength of evidence needed to prove a case. In a civil case, the plaintiff must prove on the balance of probabilities that the defendant has committed the civil wrong. That is, the standard of proof in a civil case is on the balance of probabilities. What this means is that it must be more likely than not that is, there must be more than a 50% chance that the defendant committed the civil wrong. This is a very different standard of proof from the standard of proof which applies in a criminal case. In a criminal case, you'll remember that the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. That is, the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused committed the crime. This means that the only reasonable explanation for what happened must be that the accused committed the crime. That's a much higher standard of proof than for a civil case where all the plaintiff has to prove is that it is more likely than not that the defendant committed the civil wrong. If the plaintiff can't prove on the balance of probabilities that the defendant committed the civil wrong, then the plaintiff's claim is dismissed and the defendant is not liable for that civil wrong. Well, that brings us to the end of this video. As a result of watching this video and taking notes, you should be able to describe and explain four key concepts in the Victorian civil justice system. That is, the concepts of plaintiff, defendant, the burden of proof, and the standard of proof. Don't forget to read the pages from the textbook referred to on the first slide. And if you find any additional information from that reading that you think is useful, please supplement your Cornell notes with that additional information. Thank you for your attention.